Hey, future respiratory therapist. So I got another video for you here on this Monday evening. Hope you all had a great weekend. I want to give a shout out before I get started in anything. I want to give a shout out to Courtney Jordan. Um, she's been a subscriber to the channel for a while now. Had a couple of comments and answered a couple of questions. Um, always appreciative of the, of the, of the um, content. And she just recently passed her respiratory her registered respiratory therapist exam. So she is now an RRT. So congratulations to you, Courtney. Long journey to get to this point, and now the fun begins. Okay, so go be great. Now, Gayathri wants to talk about BiPAP. He's got more questions about BiPAP, specifically related mostly to oxygenation when utilizing BiPAP, and then when do we decide to intubate? Okay, so I'm gonna answer these questions about BiPAP. I've got multiple videos on BiPAP. I'm gonna link them up here in the screen above. Okay, so you'll see those screen, you'll you'll see those links pop up along the way. Click on them if you want to see the other videos that I've done on BiPAP. Okay, so here's the question. The first question is: is when you're in BiPAP, how do you know what the optimum FiO2 is to start at? Okay, so this is FiO2. And this is starting, so starting FiO2. And we're gonna go the same as what we do with mechanical ventilation. You're looking at 40 to 60%. Unless you have some background information on the patient that makes you think that they need greater than 60%, or they may not need 40%. So you can never go wrong with starting high and rapidly weaning, okay? But if you know something about the patient and you're like, hey, 50% is gonna be just fine, then start them on 50. If you're taking them off of an airvo at 80% and you're like, okay, airvo at 80% isn't working, so now we're gonna try BiPAP to make sure to, to hopefully prevent having to intubate. If you're coming off an airvo at 80% and the person and the patient is not oxygenating, then 60% is not going to work for that person. You're going to have to start them probably at 80% also. And then as you watch your oxygenation status through your pulse oximetry, you'll wean it down. Okay, you'll wean the FIO2 down until it holds an acceptable pulse oximeter or an oxygen saturation that you're satisfied with for your patient. Okay, if you're putting a COPD -er on a BiPAP and they're on a 4 liter nasal cannula satting 92%, you probably don't even have to put them on 40. You can probably get by with putting them on 35% or maybe 30%, just depends on what it was, and hold them at 90 to 91% because that's where they live. Okay, so there really is no one answer to what is optimum FiO2 when starting or initiating BiPAP. Your guidelines should be 40 to 60% unless you know something else about your patient. If you have no idea and you know there's central cyanosis present, then start at 100 and wean down as your pulse oximetry indicates to do so. Okay? Don't ever just put BiPAP on at 100%, SATs are 100% and walk out of the room. If your SATs are 100%, you need to turn your FIO2 down every single day, any scenario. Any scenario, every single day, patient is on a 3 liter nasal cannula, setting 100%, turn it down. Patient's on a BiPAP on 90%, setting 100%, turn that file 2 down. Patient's on a vent on 40%, setting 100%, turn that file 2 down. Because you don't know, 100% tells you nothing except for the fact that they're oxygenating well. Their PO, PAO2 could be... 95 or their PAO2 could be 295 and we know what comes with too much oxygen right so with too much oxygen comes hazardous side effects whether you've ever seen them in play or not oxygen toxicity is a result of too high of FIO2s for too long so don't have your patients sitting at 100% they don't need to be if you check your pulse ox right now, you're probably 97 to 99. So why do our patients need to be 100? They don't, okay? So that's where I would start, 40 to 60, unless you know something else, and then adjust it accordingly, okay? Now the second question is, is can we increase FiO2 
to increase oxygenation. So my previous video put a big emphasis on if you need to increase your oxygenation, so increase oxygenation and you're on BiPAP, then that means increase EPAP, which is essentially the same as PEEP. Okay, so if you increase EPAP, you'll increase oxygenation. So this question is, is can we increase FIL2 to increase oxygenation? Of course you can. If you have a patient setting 85% and they're on an FIL2 of 40% and you turn that up to 80%, then their SATs should rise, okay, because you're delivering a higher amount of FIL2. So the answer is yes, you can increase the FIL2 to increase oxygenation. But the question I have for you is, is that what you really want to do? The real question is why does my patient have an oxygenation problem? What's going on pathophysiologically that is causing this patient to not oxygenate efficiently okay so can you put them up to 80 percent and get their PaO2 to go up yes but does that fix the problem does it actually truly address the problem and the other thing I want to talk to you about on this is oxygenation efficiency okay once you get to a hundred percent you're max there's nothing there's nothing I hate worse than having a patient on 100 percent FIL2 because I have nowhere else to go when the nurse says, hey, Joe, I need you to come look at my patient. They're desatting. I walk in there. They're on 100%. Eh. Right? Like, what, what's my quick fix? I don't have one. Because my FIL2 is already maxed out. Okay? Now, yes, I can think about PEEP and mean airway pressure, and that's what I would do. But how quick is that going to work? Probably not very quick, right? Because alveolar recruitment which is the result of mean airway pressure and PEEP, increasing FRC takes time. Increasing FIL2 usually results in a fairly quick response. So I don't like being 100%. So the answer to this is kind of twofold. Yes, you can increase FIL2 to improve oxygenation, but is that the best way? And I'm going to give you an example right here, okay? You have a patient on... Um, I'm just going to talk about EPAP, okay? I'm not going to talk about IPAP, so I'm just going to talk about EPAP. Is EPAP of 5 with 80% better than an EPAP of 12 at 50%? Okay, so that's the question. Which is better? Okay, well, if they both have the same PaO2, okay, so if they both have a PaO2, so we're going to say PaO2 up here, they both have a PaO2 of 80 millimeters of mercury, then we can do some math here and we can figure out which is better. Okay, so your PF ratio will tell you how efficiently you are oxygenating according to your FIL2 and your PaO2. So if you do the PF ratio here, so I'm going to do it over here. So this is the PF ratio, okay, where you put PaO2 divided by FIL2, you're going to have 80 divided by 0.8 equals 100. That's your PF ratio for this example. If you do 80 divided by 0.5, you're going to get 160. Okay? When you get... So, the PF ratio for this one is 100. The PF ratio for this example is 160. Now, neither of those are great PF ratios. But we could agree that a PF ratio of 160 is much more desirable than a PF ratio of 100. Now, the other thing that I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to put it on the board here, is think about your A to A difference. Okay? If you're on 80%, your alveolar to arterial oxygenation gradient is much larger, which means you have a lot of unused oxygen 
remaining in the alveoli that's not diffusing over into the arterial blood flow. And so, obviously, yes, you can improve it. But when you're talking about oxygenation problems, you're talking about shunts. And shunts lead to venous admixture. The EPAP component of BiPAP will help to reduce the shunt so you can get better oxygenation with less FiO2. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. Okay? The goal is not just, I just want a SAT or I just want an acceptable oxygenation no matter what it takes. The goal is to be efficient with the oxygen that you're delivering. Okay, think about your car. Think about the fuel economy of your car. If you buy a car and you never, you never, you know, change your air filter, your air filter is going to get dirty and it's going to reduce the efficiency of your fuel economy of your vehicle. Okay, can you keep putting more and more gas in it and keep getting to where you're trying to go? Absolutely. But does it make more sense? to change your air filter, improve fuel economy, and get to where you're going with less gas? Absolutely, right? That's the concept here with BiPAP, with mechanical ventilation, with all, with everything oxygenation related. If a patient is not oxygenating, why are they not oxygenating? Help fix that problem to improve efficiency of oxygenation. And then you can use less oxygen to achieve a normal state of oxygenation. I hope that makes sense. There's a lot of a lot of, of uh, efficiency and adequacy and, and those types of words, but I hope it makes sense. So if it doesn't, let me know in the comments. If it does, let me know in the comments. So I'd like to know that, yeah, this is working. I get the picture. I see what you're saying. I'm going to stop putting people on 100% in a peep of 5. I'm going to promote peeps of 10 and 50%. I'm going to promote APRV and 40% over peep of 5 and 100% or 80%. You don't need to have that much FIO2 when you're not utilizing the PEEP or EPAP aspect of things, okay? So, to answer the last question, it looks like this. The question is, is when do we decide to intubate? And the answer is quite simple. If your patient comes in and they're in respiratory distress and you put them on BiPAP, and the respiratory distress does not improve visually, looking at it with your eyes. Are they better? Do they look better? No, they don't. How long has it been? 30 minutes, 40 minutes on BiPAP? And they still look like crap? Then you need to consider intubating the patient. Maybe you don't, but you at least need to think like, is this going to work? Okay. The other thing that supports going to mechanical ventilation once you've tried initiating a BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation would be assessment of your blood gas. If you have a patient that comes in and their pH equals 7 point, let's say 7.31 and their CO2 equals a 51 when they came in and you said, Doc, and give me 35 minutes on BiPAP and we can keep this guy off the ventilator. 35 minutes is all I'm asking. At the end of 35 minutes, they still look bad and you draw a gas and it looks like this. You're probably going to intubate that patient, right? So you're looking at Am I able to reverse or to prevent the acute vent failure with the BiPAP? If you get a gas and it looks like this, then you can probably keep this person off the vent. You can probably say, see, give me time. Let me keep working. You make your adjustments, help them with a little greater tidal volume, 
get a little bit more CO2 off, now they're in normal range, and now you're not intubating. Okay? So it really comes down to two key terms. I've initiated BiPAP. My patient is still presenting with uh, data that supports acute ventilatory failure. Or after 30 minutes to an hour of BiPAP, they're still presenting with signs of impending vent failure or severe hypoxemia. And if that's the case, then you're probably going to have to intubate that patient. You just really know sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Severity of disease process comes into play. Compliance with the BiPAP machine comes into play. Synchrony with the BiPAP comes into play. Lots of different elements come into play here. But if your patient's not getting better based off of their blood gas and their appearance, then you're probably going to have to intubate that patient and you just got to talk to the doc and make that call. Okay. Hey, Guthrie, I hope this helps. If it doesn't, let me know. I got another question from you coming up here in another video here real soon, okay? Thanks for asking. Hope everybody's having a good day.